This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and today we're continuing the brand new series called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. And today we're going to see how to come to grips with God's plan for your life. Sometimes when God reveals His plan to you, it's quite a shock. It really was to the Apostle Paul. I'm going to be showing that to you today in the program. And he had to come to a place of surrender where he really came to grips with the call of God for his life. And sometimes coming to grips with God's plan is a process. And if it seems like it's taken you a while, that's all right. But in these programs, I want to help you get into the will of God so you can get through the process and begin to experience what God has planned for you. But I want you to order the whole series, which is called the will of God, the key to your success. And it really is the key to your success. When you know the will of God and you're in it. Hey, by the way, that's really important. A lot of people know the will of God, but they don't do it. They're not in it. It's not enough just to know what you're supposed to do. You got to do it. And when you know the will of God and you do it, that is the key to your success. And it positions you to live in God's supernatural power, provision, and protection. Please order this 15-part series. It will help you or someone that you know and love that's trying to find the will of God and get in it. And what I really like about this series is the study guide, which is enormous. And the reason I do these study guides is because I believe that when you hear or see the message and you read it at the same time, it really puts the teaching down deep inside you. And we need to do everything we can to get this teaching inside us. And in the study guide, I actually give you all the points, the principles, all the Greek words, they're all here. This is really like a treasure, and this also is available. And I'm also offering you right now my book by the same title, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. The back of the book says, are you ready for a life filled with adventure? That's what happens when you begin to follow the will of God. It is a trail that will lead you into a life of adventure. Look at me. That's my whole testimony. And by the way, if you haven't heard my whole testimony, you should order our series or my book called Unlikely because what we're doing is so unlikely, but we're really doing it and you can do what God's called you to do as well. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire strengthen and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Before I get into today's teaching, I want to tell you about a part of our ministry, which you may already know about, and that is our traveling ministry where we travel to the ends of the earth to teach the Bible and to minister the power of the Holy Spirit. Denise and I just got back from a wonderful, wonderful trip where we ministered in churches all over the United States. That's right couple times a year, we come into America. Now, for those of you who are new to the program, this studio is in Moscow, Russia. This is where I live. This is where God has put us. This is where the will of God led us to. But twice a year, we come to the United States and we minister. And wow, what a pleasure it is. It is an honor to stand in another man's pulpit to minister to his congregation. And on the trip that we just re- turned from. We ministered in California and Florida and Texas, all over the United States. And we met wonderful partners who came to see us, some of them driving for miles and miles and hours and hours just to sit in our services. They watch us on TV and they wanted to come personally meet us. And if you're one of them, I want to say thank you for coming to see us. It was a pleasure to see you face to face. But, you know, we're able to travel and to do our ministry like that because of our partners. Our partners pay the bills. Through their giving, they empower us to take the life-changing Word of God to people in the United States and Russia and to the ends of the earth. And if you're a partner, I want to say thank you. And if you're not a partner, please become a part of our partner family. And you can do that by going online or by giving us a call right now. But I just wanted to give you that little report. But today, we're going to talk about coming to grips with God's plan for your life. But I want to go back and cover again just a little bit of what we covered yesterday. And I want to see a picture of who Paul was 
before he came to Christ. And when you come to 1 Timothy verses 12 and 13, Paul gives his own testimony of what he was like before he was saved. And listen to how he describes himself. Now remember, this is not how somebody else describes him. These are his own words. He's saying in his own words what he was like before he came to Christ. And here's what he says. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Well, when you read that, in the King James Version, you really don't grasp the full meaning of it. These words, blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious. But when you dive into the Greek and you begin to pull out the meaning of these words, it is quite stunning. For example, the word blasphemer is a translation of the, grass, the Greek word blasphemeo, and here's what it means. I'm going to read you from my notes because I want to really get this right. I want you to understand this. This word blasphemer describes one who slanders or accuses. So he was a slanderer. He was an accuser. It means to speak derogatory words for the purpose. Did you hear that? For the purpose of injuring or harming someone else. That's really mean. It signifies profane, foul, unclean language and derogatory speech intended, intended to defame, injure, or harm another person's reputation. My friends, this is a mean-spirited person. It depicts any type of debasing, derogatory, nasty, shameful, or ugly speech or behavior intended to humiliate someone. Have you ever been humiliated by somebody who just spoke down to you? Nasty, ugly, foul, profane, derogatory words that humiliated you and put you down? That's what Saul of Tarsus did, and he enjoyed every bit of it. His speech was designed to do that to others. Now, that's amazing to me because he was a religious man. But you know, sometimes religious people have a mean spirit, and he had a really mean spirit, and he treated people terrible. Now, that's not what I'm saying about him. That's what he said about himself. But then he goes on to say he was a persecutor, which is translated from a form of the Greek word dioko, and the word dioko means to hunt, to chase, or to pursue. And it's where we get the word persecute or persecutor, as you find in this verse. But it denoted the actions of a hunter who followed after an animal in order to apprehend it, capture it, and to kill it. Now Paul uses this word to describe himself. He says, hey, before I came to Christ, I wasn't just a hunter. I was a high-level hunter. I was following the sniff of the scent of every animal, trying to sniff out their trail, talking about Christians. I was following where they were, where they were meeting, trying to find them. My intention was to capture them and possibly to exterminate them. He hated this new Christian sect, and he was out to eradicate it. And he said, hey, I was hunting them down like a hunter. Again, that's not what I'm saying about Saul of Tarsus. That's what Paul wrote about his old self. He wrote it himself. And then he adds the ugliest word of all, the Greek word, hubristus. Ay, 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 this word is horrible. This word, translated injurious in the King James Version, depicts one who in pride and insolence deliberately mistreats, wrongs, and hurts another. There's nothing accidental about this. They deliberately mistreat, wrong, and hurt another. It is treatment calculated, calculated to publicly insult and openly humiliate the person who suffers it. And it is the very word used to describe a person who derives pleasure from inflicting pain on someone else which means when they slapped the Christians or beat them and they screamed in pain, he got a thrill from it. He just loved it. He derived pleasure from it. That's what the word injurious means. Now, that shows you why you need to do Greek word studies. If you read the word injurious, you just see the word injury, but it's much, much more than that. He was really a sick and twisted individual. And again, that's not what I'm saying about him. He wrote this. 
He wrote this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 and 13. But the RIV of these verses could be translated like this. Before I was a slanderer, really taking delight in speaking nasty, derogatory words about those I thought were unfit for society. My goal was to do all I could to defame, injure, and harm their reputations. I was the most committed persecutor you can imagine, relentlessly hunting those whom I didn't agree with, and my goal was to pursue and capture them and to see to it they were ultimately put away forever or even exterminated. I was so twisted that I actually got a kick out of doing it. Can you imagine it? I actually derived pleasure from the pain I inflicted on others. And the truth is that back in those days, nothing gave me more gratification than those moments when I abused and assaulted those I didn't like. That is a literal translation of these verses. And this is Paul's description of himself. He was filled with rage and hatred before he met Christ on the road to Damascus in 37 AD. But when he met Christ, it changed his life. It put him on a brand new trajectory. And we read about his conversion in Acts chapter 3, 9, verses 3 through 6, where the Bible says, And he, that's Saul, journeyed, and he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? That word persecutest, again, a form of the Greek word dioko, why are you hunting me like a hunter? And of course, Jesus was referring to the church. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? And he, notice this, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, now he is called Jesus Lord twice, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And as he laid there on the ground, blinded by the brilliance of Jesus in a cloud of glory, he called upon the name of the Lord. And according to Romans chapter 10, that's how you get saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, some people say you got to say the sinner's prayer exactly in the right way. Well, my friends, many people get saved without saying the sinner's prayer. Their heart turns toward the Lord. They simply call upon him and bam, they get born again. And in fact, the Apostle Paul refers to his conversion in Philippians 3, 12, where he writes that in that moment when he was laying there on the ground on the road to Damascus, he was apprehended by Christ. Wow. The word apprehended is the Greek word kata lumbano. The word kata means down. The word lumbano means to take. But when you put the two words together, it means to seize to grab, to lay hold of, to pull down, to tackle, to conquer, to master, or to hold under one's power. And Paul literally said, when I got saved, I was apprehended of Christ Jesus, which means Jesus seized me, he conquered me, he tackled me, he took me down and mastered me and made me his own. Well, it doesn't sound like he had much choice in the matter, does it? Jesus literally seized him and took him. And in that moment, when he called upon the name of the Lord, he was saved. And notice also that in Acts 9, verse 6, it says that he was trembling in the moment of his conversion. And here we have a picture of a divine transaction. Oh, this is so exciting. When the Spirit of God came in, the Spirit of God was driving all the darkness and hatred and rage out of his life. That rage and hatred had consumed him, but now a divine transaction was taking place and his physical body literally began to tremble and quiver under the influence of God's transforming power. And as this divine transaction took place, God's goodness was moving into him. The Spirit of God was moving into him. And as the Spirit of God was moving into him, the evil was moving out and God was literally infusing him with power and new life as he lay trembling on the road to Damascus. Wow. The evil went out and the Spirit of God came in. And in the moment that the Spirit of God entered into his life, he received the will of God for his life. And that's what happens to you as well. I'm going to show this to you. 
When a person surrenders his life to Jesus, wonderful things take place. First, he's born again. Second, the Spirit of God enters into him. And when the Spirit of God enters into him, the Spirit of God has in him the mind of God, the DNA of God, the knowledge of God, the will of God. All of that is in the Holy Spirit, which means when the Holy Spirit enters into you, not only are you born again, you receive the mind of God, the DNA of God, the will of God, the power of God. You receive it all in the very moment you are saved. Now, your head may not understand it all, but in that moment, in that divine transaction, when you get saved, all of that enters into you. And that includes God's will for your life or God's blueprint plan for your life. All of it comes into you the very moment you're saved. Now, you may not figure it out till later, but it is in you. One reason we pray in tongues, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is because we speak divine mysteries. And when you pray in tongues, you literally begin to pull the will of God from your spirit up into your mind, where you begin to understand more of the will of God for your life. That's why you need to pray in tongues. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, and if you've never prayed in the Spirit, call us. We'll pray with you. We want you to have that ability, because when you begin to pray in tongues, the Bible says you begin to speak mysteries. You be literally begin to release from your spirit the will of God, the plan of God up into your understanding so you'll know what you're supposed to do. But Paul's head didn't understand everything at first, and that probably was true of you as well. But if you're born again and you have the Spirit of God living inside you, it means the will of God really is in you right now, which means... The will of God is not drifting out here somewhere in the atmosphere and you're trying to somehow find it. It's in you. The will of God is in you. Now you just need to get it up into your head where you understand it. But when you come to Acts chapter 9, verse 6, we read this about Saul's or Paul's conversion. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Verse 9, And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat bread or drink. But when you come to Acts chapter 26, verses 16 to 17, much, much later in his life, Paul was standing before King Agrippa and was giving King Agrippa his testimony, particularly about the moment of his conversion, everything we've been talking about. But when you read Acts chapter 9, it's Luke's testimony of Saul's conversion. But when you come to Acts chapter 26, it's Paul himself talking about his conversion. He's saying it himself. Let me tell you what happened to me. It's good what Luke said, but let me tell you what happened to me. And he adds something that is not in chapter 9. So when you come to chapter 26, verses 16 and 17, Saul sa Paul says to King Agrippa that when Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, he heard Jesus also say, Rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Okay, that immediately tells us the purpose of God was revealed to him in the moment of his conversion. And here it is. To make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will be appearing unto thee. So number one, he finds out the moment he's saved, Jesus is going to make him a minister or put him in the ministry. He also says he's going to be a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will be appearing unto thee. So now he knows he's seen Jesus once. Jesus is going to be appearing to him again or he's going to have a ministry of divine revelation. But wait, we're not done yet. Then Jesus says, delivering thee from the people and from the who? Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Now he finds out God's going to send him to the Gentiles, and not just send him to the Gentiles, but the words I send these, the Greek word apostolos, it's where you get the word apostle. He's not just a minister. Jesus is going to turn him into an apostle and apostolically send him to the Gentiles. Well, remember, he didn't like Gentiles. He had been raised to loathe the Gentiles. He believed he was not even to sit at the same table with a Gentile. And now Jesus says, I'm going to be sending you to the Gentiles. And that's why we read in Acts 9, verse 9, and he was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. His life was put on pause for three days. And during that time, he didn't eat or drink, not because he was fasting, 
but because he was probably sick to his stomach thinking about what he heard Jesus say, I'm going to send you to the low-level, dirty, stinking, filthy Gentiles. This is going to be your ministry. Ay, 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 ay. And as he sat there for three days, he was trying to come to grips with what he heard Jesus say to him. <laughs> it's kind of like when God spoke to me and told me he was sending me to the Soviet Union. I vomited after God spoke to me and told me that. I didn't say, hip, hip, hooray, let's go. I vomited. I hung over a toilet bowl and vomited for 24 hours after God told me he was sending me to the Soviet Union. I really had to come to grips with that call. And sometimes when you wake up to the call of God, <laughs> it can be quite shocking when you discover what it is that God wants you to do. But we're just getting started. We're going to come back here and pick up right here tomorrow. Oh, don't miss tomorrow. It's going to be so good. But I have something else to tell you. And then I'll be right back and I'm going to pray for you. Someone asked the question, what do the seven stars in Christ's right hand represent in the book of Revelation? Well, we read about them in Revelation 1:16, which says, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Well, as you continue reading Revelation chapter two and chapter three, Jesus speaks to these seven stars who are the pastors or the angels of the seven churches. And here we find that the seven stars represent the seven pastors of the seven churches in Revelation chapter two and chapter three, which would be the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea, Philadelphia. And Christ likens the pastors to stars because like stars give light in darkness and can even provide direction. Pastors are intended by God to provide light in darkness and guidance for those that are seeking truth. And my friends, this means your pastor really is a star. Do you hunger to know what God wants to do with your life or what steps to take to fulfill the perfect will of God? Or maybe you need an answer from heaven for a life-changing decision. You can learn to hear from heaven to know God's plan today with Rick Renner's updated teaching series, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Rick answers the hard questions about the often misunderstood subject of hearing God's voice and how you can know His will for your life. He shares from his own life how he discovered the will of God and the bumps he encountered along the way. Titles in this series include Coming to Grips with the Call of God for Your Life, Being in the Right Place at the Right Time, Don't Misinterpret What God Told You, Redirecting and Getting Back on Course. This 15-part series is available in digital or physical formats starting at just $24. We're also offering Rick's book by the same name, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Rick delves into the journey of the Apostle Paul and other key Bible characters as they saw to walk out God's will for their lives. Along the way in this fascinating process, Rick will reveal vital lessons to help you in your own pursuit to fully align with God's will for your life, which is the key to your lasting success. This book can be yours for only $19. Bundle the series and the book, The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. Don't miss this special offer. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, where do you think I am right now? This is my old TV set. I used to teach all my programs and come to you from right here in every program, but now I'm working in the new studio because you helped us to build it and I wanna say thank you. But you may ask, well, what's gonna go on in this old studio? This old studio is being transformed into a new TV studio for our new TV network which is called the Good News Channel. Think about that. God gave us a satellite network and a federal channel in Russia that has the potential to reach into every home. We actually have a federal license which allows us to take the signal of our network into every single home. That is just amazing. And I don't think anyone else has ever received this particular license. Only God could open a door that big. Wow, and now we're renovating the old studio. We're gonna completely change it. And from this space, we're gonna begin filming new daily TV programs for the new satellite network and the new federal channel, which is called 
the Good News Channel. The gospel is such good news, and we need to take it into every home. And if you're already a part of the giving team, thank you so much for being a partner. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about being part of the giving team to help us renovate this studio and to develop our new channel so we can take it into every home of Russia and not just Russia, but around the world to wherever there are Russian speakers. They need the Word of God. And together with you, we can take them the light that will transform their lives. And I want to say thank you now for being a part of our giving team. Well, today we have seen more about the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Isn't it amazing? Can you think back to when you were saved? What a work of grace took place in your life. A divine transaction as the Spirit of God came in and that old stuff went out. That's what happened to every one of us. And you also, in one instant, received the will of God and maybe you're trying to find it. It's not out here, it's inside you. And now you need to get the will of God in your heart to connect to your head so you know what to do. And that's why I want you to have my series, which is called The Will of God, The Key to Your Success. It comes with a study guide and it comes with a wonderful book by the same title. You can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call. And please let us know how to pray for you. And right now, in Jesus' name, I speak the blessing of God to you, that you would know the will of God and you would do it. I speak God's empowering presence to you that you might walk right into the will of God. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you in the next program. But remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says where the word of the king is, there's power. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.